Evening, everybody. I'm Mark Houston. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, I wasn't going to get up unless he made a mince to y'all and cleaned his shit up. Isn't that great? I love it. I was separated from uh, alcohol and cocaine the morning of October 19th of 1982, and I am very, very grateful for that. A uh, couple things, then I want to read a meditation from one of my favorite meditation books called 365 Dao. Uh, uh, I, I have really had an uh, amazingly relaxing, uh, energizing time since I've been down here. And uh, uh, over the years, when I, I feel led to come and be a part of something like this, that is not always my experience. So uh, it has been, uh, it's been great. Just great. I, I want to thank each and, and every one of you who, who uh, you know, contributed to that. I, I do know there's two elements to that. You know, the longer I get sober and the less I operate in fear, the more I demonstrate love, then strange enough, there's never anything between me and you anymore. There's no such thing as separation and fear. So I know that I have a little bit to do with that. And then, uh, you know, the rest of it is what you all have to do with that. So uh, Craig and I were talking, and I think I'm going to pretty well make this a yearly trip down here. So that's a good thing. And I'll do my best to bring more and more of my pals down here with me. Okay. Um, this is called uh, Compassion. It says, once you have seen the face of God, you will see that same face on everyone that you meet. The true God has no face. The true Tao has no name. But we cannot identify with that until we're of a very high level of insight. Until then, the gods with faces and the Tao with names are still more worthy of veneration and study than the illusions of the world. With long and sincere training, it is possible to see the face of God. Holiness is not about scientific objectivity. It is about a deep and clear recognition of the true nature of life. Your attitude toward your God will be different than anyone else's God. Divinity is a reflection of your own understanding. If your experience differs from others, that does not invalidate your sense of godliness. You will have no doubts after you have seen. Knowing God is the source of compassion in our lives. We realize that our separation from others is strictly artificial. We are neither separate from other people nor from God. It is only our own egotism that leads us to define ourselves as individuals. In fact, a direct experience of God is a direct experience of the utter universality of life. If we allow it to change our way of thinking, we will understand our essential oneness with all things. How does God look? Once you see God, you will see that same face on every person you meet. Hmm. Came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and first and foremost uh, became a part of the fellowship. And then I met a man and, and the man took me into the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and said, there's a set of precise, specific, clear-cut instructions. And if you're willing to work these with me, you'll have a revolutionary experience and you will see the face of God. And I thought he was smoking reefer when he said that to me. <laughs> but you know what? That has exactly been my truth. Um, that big book is, is amazing. Over the years, uh, uh, some, of it, some of you might relate to this. Uh, I was really driven down what I call the path of knowledge periods of time trying to understand what had happened to me, understand God, if you will. And by the way, I didn't choose that either. Um, I uh, got sent down to Kerrville, Texas, 1991, small little community down there. And uh, I started a group down there called the Carry the Message Group and started sponsoring a bunch of men. And I had to, to look for my teachers sometimes in tapes and books and all kinds of stuff. And so along the way, I, I wound up uh, studying for three years with a Native American uh, medicine man, doing the sweats and, 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 you know, walking the red road for a while. I, that was an interesting experience because Texas has got a lot of Baptists in it, and I had one next door to me, and in the back of my yard, I 
took a bunch of stones and I made a circle in the red road and the and I, I would sit out there and meditate and I found out later he thought I was a pagan worshiper. <laughs> it was an interesting experience, but uh, uh did a bunch of sweat lodges and, and uh, uh it was it was a good experience for me in so many ways. I'd lost my connection to Mother Earth and that sense of nature and that sense of oneness and then uh uh, as a result of not doing anything with meditation in my first 10 years, my mind drove me insane between my ninth and 10th year of sobriety. That's the truth. And uh, so I really became a student of meditation. You know, it's, of course, it's mentioned in the big book. Uh, it's very clear that well, we're supposed to do that every morning. Um, matter of fact, take a Concordia sometime, look up the word meditation, see how often it's mentioned in terms of spiritual practices. By the way, I, I want to make this statement. If you go to the ocean with a thimble, you get a thimble full of water. How much of God you want, and it's up to you and nobody else. You want to take a dump truck, you can get a dump, dump truck full of God. There's this idea God gives us free will. You look at the line, the steps in the big book. And within the framework of free will, there's self-will and God's will. Probably, right? If you look at what the steps do in steps four through nine, they wind up taking my self-will and aligning it with God's will. And by the time I get to the 10th step, the 10th step's about line of the will. And then I wonder why my life has changed. You know, I don't think God's will is very complex. I, I think... Uh, what, Buddhism, there's the Eight Noble Truths, Ten Commandments. I don't think it's real complex stuff, you know. Be nice, you know. <laughs> Law, cause, and effect. If you steal, somebody will steal from you. You know, it's uh, be honest. You know, we want to, oh, I wonder what God's will is. You know, it's pay your bills on time. You know, don't steal from people. Uh, you know, don't say unkind things. I mean, you know, it's not, you don't have to go sit and levitate trying to figure that out. You just really don't. Uh, it's, it, I think it's in front of you. But So back to some of my journey again, I, I really began to, to become a, a and, and study a lot about meditation and self-realization fellowship. Some of you may know something about that. They have a lot of meditation techniques. Teacher Paramahansa Yogananda. Um, I particularly begin to look at some of the stuff in Buddhism since they've been doing the most meditation the longest, like 2,000 plus years, etc. I discovered as I traveled around, uh, particularly to Christian monasteries and those kinds of things, that they were a little light in the area of meditation. And since my mind had driven me wacko, I wanted to make sure that didn't happen again. So I gravitated and moved, moved toward that. And I began a daily meditation life in 1991, which I still have up to today. And if if you said to me, of everything you've done since you were born or since you came into the rooms of AA, what is the single thing that you have ever done that had the greatest impact on your life? And I will tell you that it is meditation, going into the silence. Because in that experience, which my big book, by the way, says to do, 365 days a year, if anyone can show me where I get a few days off, I'd like to see it. I can't find that. I've tried to find it says, do this every day, and in that process, I finally realized who I really was. I realized who I was not, and I lost my identification with my mind, and my mind became like a hand. I am not my mind, and it's incessant chatter of a thousand monkeys. My mind is just like a computer that you leave running with some software. That's all it is. Most of the time, I don't pay any attention to it. I'm a lot more interested in the things that begin to happen to me in a level of consciousness I experience through the process of meditation. When I first begin to meditate, I, I begin to notice things. I begin to notice I was uh, a lot less afraid. Fear, most, you know, it's not surprising the fear inventory is between the resentment inventory and the sex inventory or personal relationships. Every alka I've ever met paralyzed with fear. The fabric of our being is interwoven with fear. We live with it. 
anything I can do to reduce that, I need to do it. And of course, you know, I read to me what that fear is about. That's that sense of separation. And as far as I can tell, the work in steps four through nine and the disciplines of 10 and 11 help remove this idea from me that I'm separate from you. Meditation becomes a vehicle that I get to use. They introduced me to some stuff I'll talk about in a little bit in the 10 steps. It says I got a new sixth sense. Well, what does that mean? You know? I, I hope uh, after we've spent a little time together that I have challenged some of you to look at some of these incredible promises and some of these, this information in this book and start talking about it in meetings. Why aren't we talking about the sixth sense in the 10 step? Why aren't we talking about in the 10 step it being the line of the will? What does that mean? Why aren't we talking about being an agent of and for God? Why aren't we talking about that stuff? Why aren't we talking about we have recovered and been given the power to help others? Right? I think it's really powerful, powerful stuff. Juicy stuff, man. Why aren't we talking about we've entered the world of spirit, and from now till the day we die, there's a way we can stay in that world of the spirit and grow an understanding of effectiveness and take it into every area of our life. All of our relationships and our work, everything, every area of our life. Why are we talking about that stuff? I don't know. That's a lie. I do know. We, we talk about what we're doing. I'll say it again. We talk about what we're doing. We don't talk about what we're not doing. That's why. You know, I, I, I cringe when I go to meetings. Anybody have a topic? I'm going, oh, no. Just where's the, you know, where do they come from? Self-pity or depending on the size of the population, it might be traffic. You know, it's just, it's just crazy, you know. But there's such, such incredible stuff to talk about. I want to um, go back. I was talking a little bit earlier to a, a young lady who talked about a lot of experience with relapse and, uh, I've worked with a lot of men, a lot of women who have chronic relapse history, and God has used me to help those people. And what I find that all in common is um, they have never understood the first step. Most of them think that alcohol and or drugs, your drug of no choice, whatever that is that you think is your drug of choice, <laughs> um, they think that's the problem. See, if alcohol was my problem, just not drinking would be my solution. Do you get that? And the big book would be two pages long. It'd say, just don't drink. Unfortunately, alcohol is not my problem. It is a symptom. Big book waits till I get up to the fourth step to present the idea of what is wrong with me. And my problem is I, I'm brutally selfish. And I think everything is about me. Selfishness, self-centered is the root of my troubles. And for whatever reason, if that doesn't leave me, if that doesn't leave, go away from me, I become so angst and diseased operating in the world that I drink to treat that. So the whole issue has never been about alcohol. The whole issue is I think everything's about me, right? Selfishness. And the book, book goes on to say, above everything, Mark, you better get rid of your selfishness or it, your selfishness, will kill you. That's what I, unbeknownst to me, when I came into the rooms, that's what I was up against. Drinking is a byproduct of that. You know, all you got to do is look at all the examples I think the book gives you to see the truth of what the book is saying. For example, there's a whole chapter devoted to working with others, correct? As a matter of fact, that chapter goes on to say when all else fails, work with someone else. So let's see. Let me think. What would be the opposite of selfishness? Working with somebody else. <laughs> right? Gee, I wonder why that's in there. Well, you know. See, if I'm sitting across working with a, another alcoholic, I totally lose my connection with me. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but if you live with me all the time, you would want to lose that connection at times. That's why I sponsor a lot of people. I really need to get away from me for long periods of time. Incessant dialogue starts, right? You know, your committee, you all... By the way, are you doing a good job identifying your host of characters? You got up this morning, your little table with all the different committee members, right? You got Mr. AA guy, Miss AA, spiritual man, spiritual woman, and whatever else it is. You got a husband probably, got a wife, right? Got a businessman, got retired businessman, you know? 
Got the timeshare condominium seller. He's down here. Got a, got a boat captain's down here. I mean, you got all kinds of different stage characters down here, right? You know, you got the, got the cooks and the just, but it's all your little host, all those voices. How you doing? How you going? You got to go do, 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 do. You know, had him get a cup of coffee and it's already got you out to 10 o'clock tonight. I tell, I tell people there's a reason we shoot ourselves in the head instead of the foot. It's to stop the voices. <laughs> Somebody's got to chair the meeting. Probably helps if it be the spiritual man or spiritual woman. But So the first step, craving the body, obsession of the mind. Experientially driven. Not rocket scientists. Doesn't take a lot to tell if I'm a real alcoholic or real drug addict. I'm the guy on page 21. When I take a drink, do I lose control? Power and choice over how much? Yes or no? Go back into the drinking. Sober, do I have a mind that takes me back to it? Do I commit the most insane act of my life stone cold sober? Because if you've lost power, choice, control once it's in your body, and then you have a pure of sobriety and go back to it again, that, ladies and gentlemen, is called insanity. See, the relapse ends when I take a drink. It doesn't start then. It ends then. It ends then because I'm going to break out in a phenomenon called craving. My last drink lasts a year and a half. I love it. I hear people sit in the rooms. They, they talk as though they know what would happen if they took a drink. If I knew what would happen when I took a drink, you'd have another speaker. I, would, I don't need to go to the rooms anymore. My problem is when I take a drink, I don't have a clue what would happen. I'm serious. My last drink lasts a year and a half. I thought I knew what was going to happen. I didn't. Drank for a year and a half. Right? See, that's me. That's my experience. I'm a real alcoholic. Do I believe that? Do I believe that no human power can separate me from alcohol and drugs and keep me separated? I'm probably like most of you. I quit drinking a whole bunch of times. Quitting was never the issue. Could I stay quit on my own power? No. That was my experience. So am I what the big book says at the bottom of page 43? Once more... Mark, at certain times, has no effective mental defense against the first drink. Mark, is that your experience? Yes. Mark's defense must, M-U-S-T, come from a power greater than himself. I became a secret power once I saw the truth of that sentence. I became that then, and I still am today. Now, some people call it God. I wasn't interested in God. I was interested in the power behind the name. Do you get what I just said? I was interested in experiencing the power behind the name, and I wasn't interested in believing in God. Most people I know walk into the rooms believing in God. Well, let me ask this question. How many of you believed in God and drank a lot? Well, it, then we come into the rooms and we get sober. Must not have anything to do with believing in God then. What does it have to do with? It has to do with experiencing the power behind the name. I mentioned this to you the other night, the trap, the trap of thinking that because you believe in God, you do. It's a great trap of the ego. For you to tell me you believe in God. Really? Do you, are you living your life as though you do? Well, what do you mean? Well, you're afraid a lot. Yeah, why do you ask? Well, if you believe in God, why would you be afraid a lot? Somebody's lying. What is it? Which voice is it? See, the two can't fit in the same box, right? Big book says, men and women of faith have courage. They, the definition of courage is in the big book. I love it. They trust their God. They trust their God. It has nothing to do with belief. I trust my God. Bring it on. Bring it to me, whatever it is. Nothing touches me but what God wants to touch me. Nothing. No one. Nothing. No one. Ever. Bring it on. What an incredible way to go through life. See? God's about 30 feet tall. I got my little arm around his calf. Got his hand right in my head. See, and I got you, boy. I got you covered. Go out and play in the playground. Boy, I go play. 
Come to places like this. Come up, stand in front. I don't know what I don't know what you need. I don't know what to talk about. I don't have to worry about it. Because I stand here and he just pats me in the head and says, okay, boy. <laughs> Stir them up a little bit. Got some old people down there resting on their ass too long. Stir their butts up a little bit. <laughs> Haven't written inventory in too long. Their goddamn sphincter muscles getting too tight. <laughs> Loosen them up a little bit. See? Have them write some inventory. Challenge them about prayer and meditation. Right? Have them get off their butt. Carry the message. Get excited about life again, right? Stir the pot a little. Whatever you say. Right? <laughs> See? Men of faith have courage. They trust their God. That's the kind of God I needed when I came in the rooms. See? That kind of a God. You write that fear inventory, and then right in the middle of that fear inventory, um, and, and I love this. This is another sentence, by the way. I think it'd be great for you guys to start talking about in, in meetings. But it, um, it talks about, I'm in the world to play the role that God has assigned. The extent as I do as I think God would have me and humbly rely on him, does he enable me to match calamity with serenity? But it says I'd never apologize for depending upon my creator. I laugh at those who think spirit out share the weakness. Paradoxically, it's the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is faith means courage. All men and women of faith have courage, and they define it. They trust their God. I never apologize for God. Here's the sentence. Instead, I let God demonstrate through me what God can do. God can stay sober. God can, can stay sober through me. Can I keep myself sober? No. I drank for 20 years. I did dope for 13. Daily. Lots of it. I was a tornado. Period. On my power. But God can demonstrate through me Staying clean and sober since October the 19th of 1982. Through me. Take a look. Take a Iowa farm kid travels all over the world talking about God in the steps. God can demonstrate through me what God can do. Open the first men's recovery center in the United States of America. First one ever. God can demonstrate through me what God can do. Powerful stuff. See? That's what this book's about. Oh, just don't drink and go to meetings. No, no, no. <laughs> so much more. So much more. Whatever it is God wants you to do, in the world to play the role he has assigned. Maybe it's just to be an incredible husband or a father or a wife or a sister or a friend. I don't know. You do the deal, you'll be shown, whatever it is. I suspect somewhere in the middle of it, though, you're probably supposed to be helping other Elkies. See, I do a lot of stuff in the 11th step, but I never do it instead. God sent me to these rooms and said, I'm going to show you a path to have a revolutionary experience and come to know me in ways that you can't even believe. But I got a lot of work for you. Because you got a lot of fellow sufferers out there, and you're the only one that can reach him because of your experience. Quick story on that. I uh, Some of you, maybe you've had this experience, but I... I have periods of time I get into some extreme spiritual intoxication. And uh, in one of those moments, it occurred to me I should maybe join a monastery. And uh, I had been seeking some counsel from a, a man who ran a monastery. He was both a, a priest and a, a monk. And so I went down to see him one time, and we sat down, we chatted for a while, and he had uh, he'd come back to Kerrville, Texas, where I was living at that time, and Stayed there for about a week and took him. I exposed him to some meetings and all those kinds of stuff. And now we get done, he goes to me. Uh, he said, uh, Mark, we really appreciate your efforts and your application to the monastery, but you just need to stay right where you are working with your kind. And I said, what do you mean, my kind? And he said, well, you know, you alcoholics and you drug addicts. He said, we don't do very well with you. But he, <laughs> he said... Uh, that, that place you go, and, and I've watched you, and you do really well with them, and they, that's where God needs you. So thanks for applying to the monastery, but we don't want you there. So, <laughs> so that's probably always going to be a part of what I do. I'm going to be sitting down across from an alcoholic or drug addict trying to help them out to with it, find their truth in the first step. And I've uh, been doing that for a lot of years, and, and I'll keep doing it. 
But I, I want to talk for a minute again about this, this deal about God. There's, there's a prayer. I ask him to remove my fear and draw He has tension. What do you have us be? I want to talk again briefly about this, this thing of fear because I, I think it's so instrumental in why sober we live miserable lives, why we don't reach for abundance, and I know it contributes to a lot of relapse. So outside of the obvious work in here, there's a couple other things about this I want to mention. Um, one is, let me ask this question. Well, are any of you, as you sit here right now in this moment, feeling fear? Any of you? Oh, some of you are. Okay. Let me ask this question of all of you who raised your hands. Are any of you in any concrete and immediate danger? Right now. Danger. Are you? Any of you? Okay. Then the fear is not real, is it? There's no reality to the fear except what your mind has given it. Now, I want you to think about something. From birth to death, most of your life, you could answer this question the way it was just answered. There's absolutely no reason to have the fear. It is manufactured by your mind. It is psychological in nature, and it is always about the future. Wouldn't it be that nice if it would be that easy to get rid of it? Is it that easy? Yes. Yes. If we have the capacity to live more in the present moment, the less we will experience fear. But you cannot do that if you're identified with its mind and its incessant chatter. And a lot of that chatter always has to do with the future. So very little of our life do we ever get to really be present. Unbeknownst to me, the, the disciplines of the 10th and 11th step thrust me into the present moment. Now, do I have to practice staying present? Yes. Craig and I were laughing today. We know ourselves too well. We have fun with ourselves. Now, we aren't leaving until tomorrow morning. We got packed today. <laughs> See, I know him. He was trying to pretend he was really in the moment. He was going to do it in the morning. And I go, yeah, you betcha. He comes out about 1 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah, you're right. I'm packed. Right? So, see, we realize that it's going to be there. Right? So we practice. Practice. Come back. How? Grab this, breathe, anything. Come back to here. Be here. Be here. Be with you. Be present to where I am. The only place I can meet God, the only reality of my life. There's no other place to meet God. You don't meet God down here or back here. Now, within this breath, this context, is the only place I can come to know God. There is no other place. Oh, okay. Because the 10th and 11th step, if you look at what the 10th and 11th step really ask you to do, the strict spiritual disciplines of those steps, and they are strict. If you don't believe me, you take him to, <laughs> take him to some man of the cloth sometime. And say, by the way, I'd like you to read about the 10th and 11th step and tell me what you think. Most of them would say, if my congregation did that, they'd be close to enlightenment. Why? Because it does. It tells us every morning. Do all these prayers, meditate. Do all this stuff during the day, and then at nighttime, do an evening review, answer all these questions, do more prayer and more meditation, and do that every day till you die. And then, then here's what's funny. In AA meetings, heaven forbid you ever mention the word religious, right? We have one of the most religious, dogmatic practices there is. Matter of fact, what most religions ask of their congregation is simple compared to what this asks of me. Right? Make amends, clean it all up, pay all the money back. I'm sponsored a guy one time, right? I'll never forget this. We get to the amends process. And good good pal of mine, and uh name's Floyd. And uh we uh, get to talking about some monies. And as it turned out, um, it was probably almost $40,000. And we got to talking about this, and uh, it was very clear to me, and according to the big book, that he needed to pay this money back. So I could tell he's getting a little angry. And I said, uh, Floyd, what are you getting angry about? Floyd came to me a believer. 
Matter of fact, his church sent him to AA. Uh, you know you drink a little bit too much then. But uh, <laughs> we can't help you, but you're a good deacon. Keep giving us your money. You go to those rooms. So at any rate, we get to this man's. Anyhow, he starts to get angry. And I said, what are you getting angry about? And he goes, well, he said, the church said I didn't have to pay it back. All I had to do was pray for forgiveness. And I said, yeah, and the church sent you to get AA to get sober. Big book says you need to pay it back, you know. So he often jokes about that. AA was the most expensive place he had ever been sent to. And he said, it's supposed to be free, right? What, it wasn't free. He did pay the money back, by the way. Yeah, still sober to this day. Um, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, I went up to the uh, fifth step last night. A, a couple things I mentioned to some of you is the idea of doing uh, multiple fifth steps in which you take a uh, body of inventory and read it to two, three, four, five people. Uh, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, it will also really help you p get pulled away from your ego. So maybe read to your sponsor, read to a couple of your protégés, those kinds of things. So I know when I uh, get back, probably over a two-week time period, uh, I probably will read inventory five times. I'll read to Craig, two other people I sponsor, and two elders in Austin, Texas. The more people you read to, the less attachment you have to the ego. You get pulled back. By the way, when I read inventory, I follow the instructions in the book. I've got to find somebody who will understand and approve what I'm driving at. I need to find somebody who understands that it's life and death. I need, I need to read inventory to someone who's a lot more concerned about my life than how they feel about what they say to me. See, when I'm reading the fifth step, I'm fighting for my life. I'm up against my ego. My ego is going to do everything in the world to justify, to minimize, to rationalize these resentments, these fears, these sexual and or personal relationships. Constantly living in that state of they're more at fault, right? It's like the guy said to me one time, well, in that relationship with that guy, 90% of the time he was at fault. And I said, well, why don't you just claim 100% of your 10 then? <laughs> Where are you going to go with that one, right? So those are some of the things that I, that I look for when, uh, when I'm looking for people to read to. And uh, I have read to women. Great, gives you a whole great perspective. Read to, read to young, read to old. I've read to uh, men of the cloth. So, but I, I find it, it's a uh, fascinating experience. Normally, every time I get ready to read, I review the instructions from page 70 to 75 so that I stay clear of what I'm about to do. I'm about to face and be rid of that which has me blocked from power I need. I'm about to look at the exact nature of my defects as a result of attempting to li live my life based on self-will. But that's what the whole purpose of this is about. It's not about anything else. It's not about I'm trying to win an award for being a neat guy. It's that I'm blocked from power. And I need to get rid of that which has me blocked from power. So I read the inventory. And you get done with the inventory, and then you have the incredible fifth-step promises. And then I wanted to talk a minute to me, there's spiritual virtue and fallen instructions. When I'm done reading inventory, then I go home and the book says I need to find a place where I'm be quiet for an hour. So I take a timer and I set it for 60 minutes. And I click it. Now it says I'm going to carefully review what I have done. So I like to close my eyes and review in a general way this inventory that I just read. Now there's a prayer in here. It says, I need to thank God from the bottom of my heart that I know God better. Now, I don't know if any of you ever thought about this, but how can I know God better as a result of reading this dismal, infantile inventory? How does that happen? Why would I? Because I, I, got, I got this kind of mind. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Why do I know God better as a result of reading that inventory? I'll leave you all to ponder that. It's a great question, isn't it? Why would I know God better as a result of reading a resentment inventory, a fear inventory, 
in a sex and or personal relationships inventory. Why? Why would I experience all those incredible fifth step promises? Now, some of this I want to throw out to those of you who haven't written in a while or struggle with writing inventory. If you had a clear idea of what could happen on the other side of inventory, you wouldn't bulk at inventory. Kind of like trading in a new car every year or something. I don't know. Great stuff. And it goes on and it says, taking the book down from the shelf, I turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. I carefully read the first five proposals. I ask if I've omitted anything. So I read each question. I sit with it. Powerless over alcohol. My life's in management. Boom, sit with it. Came to believe that a power greater than myself. And you go through it in that fashion. I'm building an arch through which I walk a free man at last. They refer to this construction site stuff with some frequency in here, in particular in the fifth step. It goes on and says, is my work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? I don't know. If, a lot of times I, I take people through and we get to this and they've been around the program for a while and this question about the stones. I don't know if you know this, but earlier on the big book told me that the second step was the cornerstone and the third step is the keystone. And if you don't know that and it asks you that question, you'll just go, well, I don't know what that means, but I got too much pride to ask anyone. I'm just going to move right on past. Right? How many of you have been sober for a while and, and, and didn't know what the stones were? Or the stones properly in place? Right? The stones for what? To build a spiritual arch through which you walk a free man and a free woman. The last stone in place is the 12th step. That's why. To be entirely rid of self, ladies and gentlemen walk through that archway, right? Are the stones properly in place? Have I skipped on the cement put into the foundation? My first step, do I know what's wrong with me? Have I tried to make mortar without sand? All kinds of construction questions. On page 75, I thought it was about not drinking. They're building houses, for God's sakes, right? See? Timer goes off, I finish the hour. Boom, turn to sixth step. How do you know when you're ready for the sixth step? When the timer goes off and you're done with the hour, that's how. <laughs> Real complex stuff, you know. If I can answer to my satisfaction all those questions, I then look at step six. I've emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Now, this next question is the only kind of, only an alcoholic drug addict would ask this question. You've looked at all this material, you've written these inventories, you've read all this. You, you understand by then selfishness is your problem. It's the reason you drink, do dope, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's a question. We've got, we've got to sit with it. It's kind of like the question, do you want to die an alcoholic death or live on a spiritual basis? And we go, well, could you elaborate on what dying an alcoholic death means, right? But here's the question. Am I now ready to let God remove from me all the things I've admitted are objections? We've got to sit with that. See, God's funny. Think about this. He, he took a tribe of people that were so asleep or think we're God, right? So it's like, I can just see him. He's talking, he's talking to St. Peter, and he goes, well, we're going to have to trick him. He said, here's what we'll do. In the second step, first of all, we'll convince them they need power. The second step, we'll let them invent us. He says, come up with your own concept, Right? They can invent us. Hell, we don't care. It's obvious everything else we put down there don't work with them anyhow. So they come up with their own concept, right? They get to invent me. Then in the third step, we're going to let them make a decision to turn their will knife over to that which created their will knife. Right? Do you get that? I'm going to make a decision to let my mom and dad be my mom and dad. Right? I mean, think about it, the third step. I'm going to make a decision to turn my will and life over to God as I understand God. Well, what created your will and life? Well, God did. Right? You see? But then, here we go. We're back to six. Well, remember who we're dealing with. So even though they've seen all this, we've got to let them think they have a choice. Right? So you have a long list of all these defects of character, which lead to you drinking, winding up where you wind up. 
Am I ready to let God remove these things that I have admitted are objections? Oh, and this next one's even greater. It's a question of faith. Can he now take them all, every one, right? We still cling to something we'll not let go. We ask God to help us be willing. I was asked earlier, uh, the most effective tool I've found for step six uh, is a tool I call the sacraments of penance. Big Book talks about identifying the exact nature of defects. So I have spent time looking for the most effective tools I could find. And that, outside of some of the religious stuff in there, is the best tool I've ever found to identify my defects of character in ways that what it does, it takes the seven deadly sins and really embellishes them, right? Now, it's a tool of the Catholic Church, but don't ask Catholics because they don't use it. <laughs> I'm serious. But it's a great tool. I've been using it for years. I had my first profound experience using this tool. What I do when I get done reading inventory is it's about seven or eight pages long. And I just go down the list. It starts like pride, putting self in the place of God. And then I pronounce myself guilty or not guilty. 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 <laughs> no, guilty. And, and it, it just, oh, God, it's got incredible stuff like, like, um, uh, uh, under, uh, oh, gossip. Uh, it's, it's fabulous. They talk about retailing gossip. I mean, it's almost like you set up a store and sell it. You know, you just, uh, but I, till I did the sacraments of penance, I thought I kind of had my act together. I've never thought that since then. You know, I, it, oh, I love it. Murder indeed or thought. Oh, no. Right? You know, you just, you, you go through and you think you're really doing well. You know, you you're think you're being kind, and then this stuff comes up. You know, retailing of gossip. And, uh, and, and well, I'll tell you the profound experience I finally had with the sixth step, because I, I picked this tool up when I was 12 or 13 years sober, was when I got done with this six or seven pages long, I was going to do a marker, because I didn't think there would be very many. Yeah, I may as well just dip the damn thing in yellow. And uh, so at that time, you know, I... I'm really, I had a deep inner conviction of how much I love God, and I'm trying to do the right thing. And I got seven pages, and they're all highlighted, right? And, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and, and like I'm, I'm meditating, and, and I'm asking God to remove this, and, and I just literally broke down. And I'll tell you why I broke down is I really thought I'd been doing okay. <laughs> and then I saw how much I fell short. And then I realized, so do you. And that's the best we can do. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay for you, and it's okay for me. And, man, I got it. I, it was okay for me to just be Mark Houston that day. There's no, nothing to arrive at. Uh, you know, as, as good as I wanted to get, man, I fall short. And it ain't going to get any better than that, right? I don't expect to get enlightened while I'm here. It's just I fall short too much. I stumble. I hit my knees. And so do you, and in the middle of that, you and I got very equal. There was none of this up here and down here and that kind of stuff. And then not too long after that experience, this same man who said, I don't want you in the monastery, I want you out there working with your people, um, he was sitting there in his own way, was doing his own sacrament and penance thing, and he breaks down crying. Now, this is a guy that he lives in a monastery. He prays six times a day, starting at 3 a.m. in the morning. He's devoted his life to prayer. In meditation, and he's sitting there weeping because he falls so short. And and I'm <laughs> and, and I'm watching this, and I'm having this experience with him. And that was my first profound effect with a six step and defects of character, and seeing why I need to come back to God, and seeing that I fall short, seeing there's no arrival place, seeing the necessity of prayer, of meditation, of forgiveness, all of those kinds of things, and getting on an equal footing with you. Realizing how most of those defects, uh, the firing mechanism for them is fear. The major firing mechanism, if you just work with the big, big seven, pride, greed, lust, anger, sloth, gluttony, etc. Fear is the firing mechanism for my defects of character. And the less fear that I'm in, the less I exhibit those. So, that's a tool. Um, any of you interested in getting a copy of that, I've got plenty of business cards with an email. I'll be happy to send it to you if you want it. Seventh step, 
simple prayer. God take all of me, good and bad. Right? Okay. Eighth step. I believe the eighth and ninth step have a tremendous amount to do based on what your sponsors have done with the eighth and ninth step. Here's what I mean by that. If you think about this, everybody in this room, our lineage could be traced back to Bill and Bob, correct? Everyone in the room. Don P. carried the message to me. He was sponsored by a man named Gary B. Gary B., I spent a little time with him last summer. Gary's 42, 43 years sober, lives in Indianapolis. His sponsor is a man named Paul M. Paul M. sobered up August 15, 1947. Paul M. had a personal experience with Dr. Bob and a, girl, a guy named Earl T. in Chicago. Paul lives in Chicago. So the message that got transmitted to me doesn't have a whole lot of BS between it, does it? So when it came time to, to make amends, the most important word in the eighth step to my lineage was made a list of all persons we had harmed and came willing to make amends to them all. All meant just that. I had to go back as far as I could remember to grade school. And I had to write down everything I ever stole that I could remember and every dime I ever, all of it, all of it. Long, long list. See, you're influenced by what you're influenced by. Get done with a list, six or seven pages of very clear instructions on how to make amends, how to make the approach. Took me 17, off that first inventory, took me 17 years to complete those amends. I completed every single amend that I had a conscious awareness of. I paid every dime of the money back. I went to nine different states. You want what I have, you do what I do. Okay. How free do you want to be? How much of God do you want to know? I don't know. Pay all the money back. Okay. Go clean it up. I went to grave sites. Back into high school. Teachers. Ex-wives. Employers. Offered a amazing, just amazing stuff. All over, Alaska, Oregon, Washington, California, South Dakota. Cleaned it up. It is difficult for me to describe what it was like the day that I made the last amend that was in my state of consciousness. Here's the other piece that happened to me, I think, that day, why I look at the big book and its promises, ninth step. Is that day I lost my fear of dying. If you lose your fear of dying, you have no fear of living. You live with complete abandon. What a difference. That's why I like to stay current. See, if I die today, my slate's clean. As far as I know, ladies and gentlemen, I resubmit to the first nine steps. I want to keep it clean. Now, there's a theory. Don't know if this is true. Some people like the idea of there's reincarnation. I don't know about that. It's kind of like a priest one day. He was telling me what he thought was going to happen to me when I died, and I asked him if he had any experience with that. <laughs> and he said no. And I said, I'm not interested in your opinion. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm an experienced kind of guy. But... In the event that there's such a thing as reincarnation, part of that whole theory is the way you left is the way you come back. So in the event that that may be true, my slate is clean. <laughs> I love my tribe, but God damn, this has been a tough life at times, right? I'd like to come back just, I don't know, maybe live in the same town my whole life or something. You know, marry once instead of four times, you know, just different things. Who knows? But that ninth step will thrust me into the tenth step. And I want to talk a little bit about 10 or 11. And I could go on, I could spend a whole weekend on the ninth step. But the instructions there are fairly clear. I want to talk some more about some of the stuff that happens when we hit this tenth step. There are, how many paragraphs? Let's see, one, two, 
three, four paragraphs in the tenth step. Very seldom do we ever talk about the, the last two. But, and visualizations help for me. So I, I'm going to do this with you. It talks about we've entered the world of the spirit by the time you get to the tenth step. It starts out like this. It says, this thought. What thought? The thought of finishing your amends. Brings us to step ten which suggests that we continue to take personal inventory and continue to sit right in any new mistakes as we go along. So the day I start making amends is the day I start working with the disciplines of the 10th step, if you believe the instructions of the book. It says, I vigorously commenced this way of living as I cleaned up my past. Next sentence. We have entered the world of the spirit. Why aren't we talking about that sentence in meetings? We've entered the world of the spirit. What does that mean? This is my experience. You do the work in the first nine steps. Earlier, we were told the only reason we're going to write inventory is to face and be rid of that which has us blocked from God. God lies deep down within. We're blocked. We do the work in four through nine. We are not blocked. That's why you have all those incredible fifth step promises. And by the time you get to the ninth step, you've entered the world of the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that which was blocking you before from the Spirit housed within here is now gone. You have entered the world of the Spirit. You now have an awakened spirit. You now have a new sixth sense. And by the way, 10 and 11 allow you to continue to have this awareness. You don't do 10 and 11, all that work you did to face and be rid of that which has you blocked, that wall starts coming back again. Pretty soon, you're up against yourself, feeling separated from, and you've lost contact with the fact that you got a spirit housed in here. That's why I keep doing 10 to 11. So I've entered the world of the spirit. Think of it as this way. Think of it as though we, we've stepped into a room, right? And this language, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the 10th and 11th step is new language. It's not language to appeal to your cognitive mind. It is language of the spirit. It's a whole different language. It's saying my next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness using your awakened spirit. Go here, do this, boom. You see what I'm saying? I mean, look at the series of events that took place to have all us here this evening. He, 97 travel agents couldn't have made this happen. Every one of us in our own way had an awakened spirit that responded to us being here. I mean, I love it down here, but I had other things to do. So do you. But there was a part of us that responded, and we're all here. That's what that's about. It goes on to say, we're, we're here to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. And then it talks about, with your awakened spirit, continue to watch. What? Watch yourself. For what? Selfishness, dishonest, resentment, and fear. You're observing yourself, right? When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately, make amends quickly. Then we resolutely turn. Spiritual practices. Turn is a spiritual practice. Turn out of yourself. Turn away from yourself. Turn to someone you can help. Love and tolerance of others is your code. Now, here's these incredible 10-step promises. That can only manifest through an awakened spirit. Love and tolerance of others is my code. You can't practice that with self-will intact. It's impossible. How about this? I've ceased fighting anything or anyone dash, even alcohol. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine living that on a daily basis? Ceased fighting? What does that mean? It means I've ceased fighting. <laughs> Traffic, lines, angry people, ceased fighting. She wants to stay, she wants to go, the health comes, the health goes. Ceased fighting. That's exactly what it means. And it says even alcohol. Why? Because for this time, sanity will have returned. They flip us back into liquor. I'll seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, I recoil from liquor as though from a hot flame. I react samely and normally, and this happens automatically. 
My new attitude toward liquor has been given me with no thought or effort on my part. It just comes. That's the miracle of it. I'm not fighting, nor am I avoiding temptation. Check this out. As a result of this work, I've been placed in a position of neutrality. I am safe and protected. Bring it on. Okay. I am safe and protected. I don't want to, geez, I wonder if they got liquor there. I don't care. I'm in a position of neutrality. I've been restored to sanity. Would you like a drink? No, you don't have enough. <laughs> you know? Would you like a drink? Only if you want me sleeping with your wife. You don't know. <laughs> See, I'm sane. I've been restored to sanity. I'm in a position of neutrality. It says the problem's been removed. What problem? The obsession of the mind, the spirituality. That problem. It said it's been removed. It does not exist. I'm neither cocky nor am I afraid. That is my experience. Is it your experience? This is how I react. Pay attention. As long as I keep in fit spiritual condition. Doesn't say anything in there about God, does it? Fit spiritual condition. That's how I react. Position of neutrality. Cease fighting anything or anyone, love and talents of others. If I do what? Stay in fit spiritual condition. How do you do that? Well, they're going to tell us. We're not going to like it because it means we've got to do a little work. Easy to let up in the spiritual program of action, rest on laurels. Headed for trouble if we do. Why? Alcohol is a subtle fool. We're not cured of alcoholism. I'm given a daily reprieve. See, this is where God gets even. Says, I'm going to let them invent me because they're so arrogant, nothing else will work. I'm going to let them make a decision to turn their will and life over to that which created their will and life. They'll get that. Then, because they're God and they're judgmental, they're going to write these inventories because everyone else is always to blame because they won't do what they want because they like to play God. Then they're going to read it to someone. They're going to defile these defects of character. Then they're going to ask me to take them. And they're going to go out and make amends. And now it's payback time. Because in order to stay sober and realize all this neat stuff, there's all kinds of stuff they got to do on a daily basis. <laughs> right? <laughs> and they start to talk about what it is. We're given a daily reprieve contingent of the maintenance of spiritual condition. Every day is a day when these people must carry the vision of God's will in all our activities. Say a prayer. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. That's a practice. You get up in the morning before you go into work. Sit down at your desk. Say that prayer. You work for an hour. You get ready to move to another activity. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. Move over here. It's a practice. Tenth and eleven step are practices, ladies and gentlemen. You could do them the rest of your life. Turn is a practice. Pause is a practice. Ask is a practice. These are incredible things that you and I get to work with during the course of a day in all the areas of my life. It says, these are thoughts which must go with me constantly. I can exercise my willpower along this line. All I wish is the proper use of the will. The 10th step is about the line of the will. I want you to think about this. You did your evening review. Your little sunbeam for God. You went to bed and slept great. Little eyeballs pop open, right? Little committee starts talking. You make your coffee. You sit down. On awakening, we consider our plans for the day. And then you start saying your prayers and doing your stuff and you meditate. You're hooked up. Line of the will, right? Now, you walk out to your door. Put the hand in the door. There's going to be someone in the parking lot blocking my car. You're already a little off the line. <laughs> right? Thy will be done. Boom, back. Get in. Go into Starbucks. Three cars in front of you. Boom! Way over here. What are they doing? It's too early in the morning. Right? Thy will not mind be done. Boom, back. Line of the will all day long, right? You get a phone call. Put you in tons of fear. Wow, way over here. <laughs> right? God, remove fear. How many rhymes would you be? Boom, nope, didn't quite make it. Do it again. God, remove the fear. What'd you help me be? Boom, I'm back. Now imagine you're not doing any of this. By the time you come to the meeting I'm at, your ass is like this. <laughs> and you want to talk about self-pity. And it's God's fault. He gave you 10-step practices all day long. Line to the will. Boom. Back. Back. Ass. Pause. Turn. Cease fighting. Wow. Powerful, powerful stuff. Imagine if you're not doing any of these practices. One day goes by. Two days. Nine days. That's when you pick up the paper and go, 
Well, it says in the paper that Brad picked up a machine gun, killed nine people. <laughs> Just don't drink, go to meetings. You understand the point? You see what you see how far off you get? See, I, I don't have the luxury of doing this stuff. See, I do the eleven step in the morning, get hooked up. Got your plants, got your cats, whatever, you get all hooked up. You put your hand in that door, it's on. You're out there. That's where the 10 step, pause, ask, turn, cease, right? Great stuff to bring you back. Sixth sense, right? Stay hooked up. Many times throughout the day, that will be done. You do this all day long. Then you go home at night, you open your book, you do all the evening review questions. To do what? To see if you're awake during the day. Be able to get a decent night's sleep to see if there's any corrective action. I told you, God gets even. <laughs> right? There's no rest for us once we get to 10 to 11. There's just not. Then you get up the next morning, consider the plans for the day, and sometimes that's carrying over corrective action. You see how powerful this stuff is, though. You see, the 10th and 11th step to me are an abyss. There's no end to the practices that you can do with it. Makes you more effective in every grow in understanding and effectiveness, right? But powerful, powerful stuff. Twelve step takes care of itself, as it has was evidenced by all of us been here. A uh, couple of things, and then I'm going to close it up. Um, to me, one through nine are a series of steps to allow me to experience the spiritual dimension of the tenth and eleventh step, and then allow me to take that awaken spirit out into this world to grow in understanding and effectiveness in every area of my life, every single area of my life, to live an abundant life beyond my wildest dreams. Along the way, practice some of the principles that we've been taught about. But see, what, what a deal. What, I, think, I think we all have an obligation to take that new alcoholic, to take that new addict and talk to him about this God. See? To talk to him about this power that can come into their lives, how it can change and transform their lives. That they can get taken places beyond their wildest dreams if they want to. Remember? See, I work off spiritual consent. Craig, anyone I work with, Brad, they've given me spiritual consent in their life. If you haven't given me spiritual consent, I'll never say a word to you about how you're living your life. If you give me spiritual consent, and, I, and I, ha I have given spiritual consent to all kinds of people, in which I give them consent to say to me, you're just a little off the beam there. You're getting ready to mix the Kool-Aid, buddy. <laughs> See? See, I'm the kind of guy, you give me enough space, I'd be like David Koresh, we're holding up, we ain't coming out. <laughs> Going to rewrite the big book, you know, with the best of intentions. See, so you got a spiritual consent, boom, get some people, they pull you back on track. But don't miss out on this. God bless you all, I love you.